Hey guys, this is Cole. This episode is kid friendly for creeps like me. <laughs> when you're alive, life can be fun. Go to the forest where the shadows do run. They're coming soon. And we are Paranormal Chicks. And this is another kid-friendly episode. So get your little creepsters, snuggle up to them, and sit back and listen. This story is from the book, Out to Get You, 13 Tales of Weirdness and Woe. It's by Josh Allen, and it's illustrated by Sarah J. Coleman. This story is called The Color of Ivy. Ivy found the marker under her desk. She felt something with her foot while Mr. Jameson had been reviewing that day's homework assignment, a long worksheet on prepositions. So she peered down to check what was there. The marker was thin and glittery and greenish black, and she'd never seen anything quite like it. She bent and picked it up. It was warm, as if it had been out in the sun. She removed the cap, and its dark tip glistened. Bringing it to her nose, she smelled its ink. It was sweet, like honey. I wish it were mine, thought Ivy. If it were, she knew exactly what she'd draw. A dark, enchanted forest with lots of hanging vines. It was the perfect color. She considered stuffing the marker into her backpack quietly. Instead, she tapped Kiara's shoulder in front of her. Is this yours? She whispered, holding up the marker. Did you drop it? Kiara shook her head and went back to the preposition worksheet. Ivy waved the marker slightly, showing it to other students sitting around her. Each one shrugged. Not mine, said Malcolm. No, mouthed Kirk. Ivy set the marker on her notebook. It must have been dropped from a student in an earlier class. It looked new and fancy, and was probably part of a set. Ivy imagined it lined up neatly in a plastic case with other glittering colors. She squinted at a sign that hung in the front of every classroom beside the clock. Please return all lost or stolen items to the main office. She fingered the marker and rolled it back and forth on her notebook. The color was like moss on an old brick wall. Ivy liked that. She picked it up and drummed it on the edge of her desk. It's really the perfect color, she thought. It was the color of Ivy, she realized. Her color. The color of Ivy, she smiled. She popped the cap off and flattened her left hand on her preposition worksheet, spreading her fingers. Since the marker was, after all, her color, she decided to try it out on her own skin. I did look for the owner, she thought. Besides, it's just a marker. Still, the marker's glittery color and perfume scent told her the marker was different. Special. On the back of her hand, she drew a strand of ivy. She started by making a curve, twisting the vine just underneath her knuckles. The ink came out warm, the exact same glittery greenish black as the marker's cap. She drew three leaves on her strand of ivy, one leaf for each letter of her name, one for the I, one for the V, and one for the Y. When she had finished, she blew on her hand softly. She touched the vine with a finger, testing to see if the ink would smudge. It didn't. Then, she twisted her hand under the classroom lights and let the greenish, glittery ink shimmer. She had never been much of an artist, but Ivy had to admit it. The strand of ivy on her hand looked good. Almost real. It was nearly perfect. This thing she was named for on her skin is the best color ever. Just then, the bell rang, jarring Ivy back to class. Before you leave, Mr. Jameson called out over the loud noise of students gathering folders and stuffing backpacks. Make sure your names are on your preposition worksheets and turn them in at the basket. Ivy peered down at her homework. 
She had forgotten to fill in the blank space at the top of her page for her name. She gripped the marker. Then she had an idea. Instead of filling in her name, she could draw a strand of ivy with her perfect new marker. Mr. Jameson would see the twisting vine on the line where her name usually went, and he'd figure out whose assignment it was, wouldn't he? She decided to go for it. She started with the twisting stalk and then added three leaves, one for the I, one for the V, and one for the Y. Again, her vine, her name vine, she decided to call it, looked perfect, almost real. The greenish-black ink glittered. She stood and dropped her assignment in the basket. By the time she got back to her desk, most of the other students had filed out of the classroom. Peering around, she zipped the marker into the front pocket of her backpack, which she slung quickly over one shoulder. When she got home, she plopped her backpack onto her unmade bed and pulled out the marker. She wanted to label her stuff, to write her name fine on lots of things. She started by scrawling across the top of her journal. The journal's cover was light orange, and the name find looked perfect stretching across the top. She pulled out her school notebook and binders and labeled them with her name find too. She drew the vine on the softballs in her closet and on her bat. She even doodled on the small tag on her stuffed animals. Where else can I put it? She thought. She knew some people wrote their names on the inside of covers of their books in case it ever got lost or borrowed, so she went to her bookshelf and started sliding books out. Inside of the cover of each one, she drew her twisting vine. She drew the leaves as she mouthed the letters of her name, I-V-Y. It took her nearly half an hour to label everything in her room, and when she finished, she zipped the marker back into the front pocket of her backpack. She looked once more at the name vine on her hand. She made a fist, twisted it, and the drawing, complete with four leaves, seemed to ripple. Four leaves, she thought. She counted them again. Yes, there were definitely four. One leaf under each of her four knuckles. She was certain she'd drawn just three leaves when she found the marker. One leaf for the I, one leaf for the V, and one leaf for the Y. Since then, she had drawn the same thing, maybe 50 times. There had been three leaves, just three, each time. She pulled a book from her shelf and opened it. There, on the inside of the front cover, was a four-leafed vine. She checked the cover of her journal. Four leaves. She checked her school notebook and binder and her softballs and her bat. She checked the tags on her stuffed animals. They all had four leaves. I messed up, Ivy thought. I got distracted, and I drew an extra leaf. But how could she have made the same mistake over and over? She shook her hand and flexed her fingers, and the vine below her knuckles seemed to twist and stretch. The next morning, she showered, but she tried to keep her left hand out of the steaming water. Even though she'd messed up her name vine by adding an extra leaf, she still liked it and wanted to keep from washing it off. So she held her hand out towards the back of the shower and soaped and shampooed with her right. Still, the vine got a little wet from the steam and splashes. Stepping out of the shower, Ivy slipped into her bathrobe and dabbed her hand lightly with a towel, careful not to wipe or smear. She lifted the towel and gasped. The inky vine now curled down her hand and around her wrist. It had more leaves. Lots more leaves. Ivy counted quickly. Nine of them in all. Most were small, as if they'd just sprouted. She ran to her room and pulled her journal from her desk drawer. The vine across the top now twisted and sprawled down the journal's cover. It had nine leaves. She checked her binder and books. Nine leaves. She checked her stuffed animal tags, her softballs, her bat. The vines all had nine leaves. She looked back to the vine on her hand. The water from the shower, she thought. I watered the ivy and it grew. And all of the other vines had too. Whatever happened to the vine on her hand, it seemed to happen to the rest of them. What if they kept growing, she thought. She started breathing quickly. What if the vine on her hand spread up her arm and onto her face? What if it covered her whole body? How would she look with glittery vines covering her from head to toe, spiraling around her eyes, wrapping around her neck? She brought her hand to her throat. 
the color of ivy, she thought. Suddenly, the name vine didn't seem so cool. Ivy's heart thudded. She had to get rid of it. Whatever this thing was, it was spreading. She wanted it gone. She bolted back to the bathroom, turned on the tap, and grabbed a bar of soap. But before she plunged her hand under the water, she stopped. Would the vine even wash off? She turned the faucet down to a trickle and let a few drops drip onto her hand. The ivy glittered, and then the vine twisted and grew, sprouting leaves and circling a few inches up her arm. No, she thought. She grabbed a dry washcloth and scrubbed till her skin hurt, but the vine kept growing. It swirled to her elbow. It sprouted more leaves. She grabbed her hairdryer and blasted it on high. She pointed it at the vine and held it steady. Her skin turned red and burned, but it didn't help. The vine may have changed color slightly, taking on the faintest hint of brown, but it was still there, shiny and glittering. She ran to her room. The vines were everywhere. They circled her softballs and spiraled around her bat. They covered her journal and bled out from the inside covers of her books. They wrapped around her stuffed animal's legs and arms and stomachs. What is this? She thought. What have I done? She wore a long sleeve sweater to school that day, and when no one was looking, she pushed up the sleeve and checked the vine. It hadn't grown any more, but it hadn't shrunk or shriveled either. It just stayed there, twisted around her arm. All day she avoided water, but when she used the bathroom after second period math, she left without washing her hands. During lunch, when it started raining, her friends Madison and Carrie ran outside to splash, but she moved away from the doors deeper into the safety of the dry school. And when she was thirsty, she filled the water bottle one-handed in one of the school's drinking fountains, careful not to splash, and she sipped the water through a tall, thin straw, just in case. In English, Mr. Jameson held up her preposition worksheet from the day before. Someone, he said, forgot to put their name on this. The margins of the worksheet were completely covered in greenish-black vines, but that same someone did take time to draw a jungle. Ivy didn't speak. No one's claiming it? Mr. Jameson said. Ivy pulled her sweater down over her knuckles, far enough to cover the vine on her hand. Very well, Mr. Jameson said. Someone will be getting a zero. She didn't sleep well that night, not with all the vines in her room. It was like she was camping in a rainforest. The next morning, she sat on the edge of the bathtub, studying the vine on her arm. It had lost some of its glitter. She was sure of it. A few leaves even seemed to be drooping, and she thought that maybe the occasional crease and crinkle were showing up in the twisting stalk. The vine hadn't yet reached her shoulder. Even better, it hadn't grown at all since she'd kept away from water. Neither had any of the other vines in her room. She wasn't sure, but the vines, she thought, were starting to look a little thirsty. She backed away from the bathtub. Instead of washing and drying her curly hair, she pulled her hair back into a simple ponytail. After breakfast, she checked the weather forecast. No rain, so she headed to school. That night, her mother leaned in close, squinted at her hair, and said, Ivy, did you remember to use shampoo today? Ivy shrugged. Your hair looks a little greasy. Ivy shrugged again. Well, don't forget tomorrow. Ivy ran her vine-free hand through her hair. Her fingers picked up the slightest oily film. But the vines are shriveling, she thought. She was sure of it. They weren't a deep greenish black anymore. They were greenish brown, and they hardly glittered at all. When she checked the vine on her arm before going to bed, two of the leaves had even fallen off, one on her forearm and one by her wrist. If Ivy could just keep her arm dry for a few more days, she was sure the vines, all of them, would vanish. The next morning, Ivy locked the bathroom door. She grabbed a dry towel and wrapped it around her arm. Then she turned on the water. She didn't even take off her clothes. The water ran while she sat against the wall on the far side of the room. She let the water run for 10 minutes, long enough for her mother to hear and the mirror to start fogging. Then, with her arm still in the towel and stretched out far behind her, she cranked the water off. Before leaving the bathroom, she put on extra deodorant. 
In her bedroom, she checked the vine in her journal. No more leaves had dropped, but its stalk was definitely thinning. Definitely. Ivy tucked her hair into a purple baseball cap, and she managed to leave the house without coming face to face with her mother. The vines proved harder to kill than Ivy had hoped. Five days later, they still had four leaves. On her arm, the leaves were in a clump, halfway between her wrist and elbow. The stalk in her hand, though, was definitely brown. Ivy kept her hair tucked up in a bun now. It had become stringy and oily and was tucked together in greasy clumps. And though she'd never had acne, families of zits had popped up on her face and neck. But she felt so close, so close to killing the vines and being free. Still, she knew her mother could ruin everything. All it would take was for her to get one close look at Ivy's hair or inhale one big whiff of Ivy's moldering smell and her mother would order her into a big tub of warm soapy water so ivy became too busy to spend much time at home she told her mother she needed to attend study groups at the library she needed to stay after school and complete extra credit she needed to meet a tutor at the park when she did have to be home ivy wore long sleeves and hoodies that hid her face and hair and she ate her meals quickly if mother tried to talk to her she muttered about homework and darted off to her room where she sat surrounded by slowly withering vines. She just needed to hang on, she told herself, just a little longer. She could handle the bits of grime around her toenails. She could deal with the black grit behind her ears. She could even accept that no amount of deodorant could cover her smell anymore. A smell that was something like a head of lettuce rotting away in an old locker room. Because when she thought of what might happen if she took a bath, how the vines would stretch across her whole body, wrapping around her ankles, tracing along the grooves in her ears, she refused to quit. Not now. Over the next three days, only one more leaf dropped. But the vines on her arm and her journal and her books and her stuffed animals seemed to be getting thinner. She felt gritty all the time, and in class, the kids who sat next to her scooted their desk as far from her as they could. One day at lunch, she sat at her usual place and waited for Madison and Carrie to join her. She chewed her sloppy joe. She looked around. She heard the whispers. You can smell her from here. She's like a garbage dump. You can actually see the grease in her hair. We should call her Poison Ivy. Halfway through her sloppy joe, she scanned the lunchroom and found Madison and Carrie. They were eating together and laughing at another table far away. It will be okay, she told herself. In a few more days, the vines would be dead. If she could just hang on, then soon, very soon, she could fix this. She would clean herself up and get back to normal life. Five days later, the vines still weren't gone. She didn't understand it. All the leaves had vanished, but the brown stalks remained. Her hands, she decided, were the dirtiest part of her. She spilled a glob of grape jelly on them the day before, and she tried wiping it off with a dry napkin, but it just seemed to smear the jelly into a layer of existing grime. When she balled her fingers into a fist, they stuck together as she tried to open them. At dinner, her mother sniffed the air and peered at her eyes and asked Ivy to peel back her hoodie. I have a ton of homework, Ivy said, standing up and pushing away her plate. Her mother said, stop, honey, the hoodie, now. And then she said, I haven't seen your face in weeks. Slowly, Ivy lifted her hands and pushed her hood back and kept her head down. Her mother gasped. Ivy, her mother said, standing up. Oh, Ivy, what is this? Ivy folded her arms and pressed her lips. How could she possibly explain? Why are you doing this to yourself? Her mother reached out and felt Ivy's hair. You're covered in grime, she said. You're going to get sick. Ivy shook her head. You need a shower, her mother said, her voice rising. Right now, how long has it been? Ivy shrugged. You have to take care of yourself. Ivy didn't speak. She turned away and lifted her sleeve. The vine was still on her arm. It was faint, barely a thin brown line, but she could still see it 
trailing down her skin like a winding vein. She shook her head. Honey, this isn't a request, her mother said. But without a word, Ivy walked into her room, closed her door, and locked it. A few minutes later, her mother knocked. You'll shower, young lady, and you'll wash your hair or you'll be grounded for a month. A month? Ivy said quietly, checking the vines around her. They were so thin, so brown. I'll take it. In school, hallway crowds parted around her. Kids who sat next to her plugged their noses. Girls left the bathroom quickly when she walked in. The creases in her knuckles became crusted with dirt. The grooves at the base of her fingernails became caked with black gunk. The crannies inside her ears grew crusty and hard, and the backs of her knees turned grubby. No one talked to her. She sat alone. She studied alone. She ate alone. She spent even less time at home. She sat in the library. She wandered around parks. She hid behind trees in her own backyard. Almost there, she told herself, as she entered her room one night and had to squint to see the disappearing vines. Just a little more. On Ivy's 23rd day without a shower, Mr. Jameson passed out a worksheet on adverbs. When he handed one to Ivy, he shook his head slightly as he looked down at her. Her hair, which had once been soft and wavy, was now thick and clumpy. Ivy reached for her worksheet, and her fingernails left small grease smudges on the paper. At the top of her assignment, a line asked for her name. Ivy reached into her backpack for a pencil. She pulled out, instead, the marker. Somehow, she managed to forget about it. She'd been so focused on the vines, so focused on killing them, that she hadn't even touched it. But it had been there, this whole time, in her backpack. She set the marker on her desk, and she pulled up her sleeve to check the vine for what must have been the thousandth time. Her skin was flaking. Dirt crusted her arms. Ivy leaned close and stared. She blinked. She couldn't believe it. The vine was gone. Yes, the vine was gone. It was completely, wonderfully gone. She checked all her notebooks and binders, pulling them out of her backpack one by one. There was nothing on them, not even faint lines. On her arm was just her skin, her greasy, dirt-stained skin. She closed her eyes and let out a heavy breath. It's over, she thought. She fought back tears. She thought of her shower at home, how she couldn't wait to turn the knob and stand beneath the water and let it run off of her in murky streams. She would stand there for hours. She would make up for the last 23 days. Even if the hot water ran out, she would shampoo her hair over and over. She would scrub her skin with a hard brush and she would use a complete bar of soap. No, two. And then she would use body wash, all she could find and an anti-acne face scrub, and globs and globs of conditioner. And when the last crusts of dirt had peeled off and floated down the drain, when she was finally clean, she would dress in newly washed clothes and hug her mother and say she was sorry. She was so, so sorry. And she let her mother hold her and breathe in her soapy, perfumey scent for hours. And then things could be normal again. Maybe the whispers that surrounded her would stop, and the jokes, and the nose plugs. Maybe, in time, even Madison and Carrie would come back to her. She took one last look at the greenish-black marker that had started everything. When she bent and set it on the floor beneath her desk, she pushed it away with her feet. Then, she reached back into her bag, fumbled for a pencil, and in the space on the adverb worksheet that called for her name, she wrote three clear block letters, I-V-Y. This story is called Neato Burrito. So I'm walking home from school, strolling down the sidewalk along Magnolia Avenue, and I'm thinking about Caroline Spencer and her green eyes and the way she tucks her hair behind her ears when she makes comments in history class. Lately, I've been thinking a lot about Caroline Spencer and her green eyes and the way she tucks her hair behind her ears when she's making comments in history class. And the truth is... I'm starting to get a little weirded out. I'm ready to get back to thinking about the Red Sox and the hot dogs at Fenway Park and the catcher's mitt I got for my birthday. But I can. Because did I mention that Caroline Spencer has green eyes? 
Did you know that she tucks her hair behind her ears when she makes comments in history class? So yeah, I'm walking and kicking at the sidewalk pebbles as I go, and I'm telling myself to think about baseball, 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 but it's no use because I'm also thinking about the last two words I said to Caroline Spencer. The last two idiotic words. Here's what they were. Neato burrito. Neato burrito, I mutter out loud. I shake my head a little. Where did those words even come from? I come upon a big pebble. It's the size of a quarter, and I kick it as hard as I can. It bounces down the sidewalk and drops into the gutter. Then it plinks against something metal, something that makes a shiny thunk sound. I look and a gold reflection in the gutter catches my eye. I walk over and can you believe it? It's a lamp right there in the gutter. But it's not the kind of lamp that you'd have in your house. It's the kind of lamp that you'd rub to make a genie come whooshing out. It's scratched and copper colored and it's about the size of a football. Cool, I say to no one, certainly not to Caroline Spencer, who I guess is still out pounding erasers and won't be coming this way for at least 10 more minutes. Baseball, I tell myself, think about baseball. And then I pick up the lamp. I grab it by the tiny little handle thing. It's warm, and there's a long snake carved around the base. I start rubbing it with one hand, because that's what you do with a lamp like this, right? I mean, who wouldn't? Of course, I know nothing's going to happen. This lamp is just junk someone dumped in the gutter. But no one's around, and it's pretty tempting. So I mutter to myself as I rub the lamp for fun. Oh, great genie of the lamp, I say. I call you forth. Then, get this. The lamp starts smoking. Seriously. It looks like it's gushing steam. Like a teapot with a narrow spout puffing away. I startle and drop the lamp, and it clatters back to the gutter. Then, hiss, boom, poof. There's a genie floating in the air, just like that, an actual genie. He's got a purple head wrap and a matching little vest and a goatee. Who summons me from my slumber, he says. His voice is deep, and it echoes down Magnolia Avenue. There are a few kids walking on the next block, but they don't turn my way, so I figure they must not be able to see or hear the genie. I guess only I can do that. Crazy, right? My mouth drops, and I make what my mom calls my no-way face, but I blink hard, and sure enough, this is all real. There's a genuine genie right here, hovering just over a fire hydrant on Magnolia Avenue. The genie glares at me. His bottom half funnels down into the lamp, and I can't tell whether he has legs or not. I snap out of my little trance, and I realize that the genie asked me a question. So I say, oh, I guess I, um, summoned you. He looks at me from bottom to top, peering from my shoes to my knees to my chest and finally to my eyes. He licks his lips. I'm Matt, I say. I raise one hand and give a little wave. Right after, I wish I hadn't. The genie sort of drifts around like a balloon on a string. One wish, he says, and then his eyes begin to narrow. He holds up one finger. All of his fingers, even his thumbs, have rings on them. I will grant you one wish, no more, and then I will return to my slumber. I thought I got three wishes, not one. Isn't this always the deal? But I'm too amazed to say anything, so I shake myself and try to stick with what's happening. Speak your deepest desire. The genie opens his arms. Speak it, Matt, and I will make your dreams come true. Your deepest desire. Your dreams come true. Those words echo around in my head, and I think about, surprise, surprise, Caroline Spencer. But then I slap myself on the inside. See, I might be an idiot, but I'm no dummy. I've read the books. I've seen the movies. I know how this works. Wishes never go the way you plan them. Never. Here's what I mean. Suppose I ask this genie for a bajillion dollars. What'll probably happen is this. I'll make my wish and hold out my hands ready for money to plop down from the sky. But then, as I'm standing there, looking up, some guy with a clipboard and an official sounding name, a name like Montgomery McAllister, will stroll up and tell me that my parents were just killed in a tragic car accident. 
He'll tell me my parents owned a huge life insurance policy, and now I'm rich. Presto, my wish has been granted, and I'll spend the rest of my life orphaned and lonely. Or say I wish to become the world's best baseball player. Just like that, I'll be smashing home runs on final pitches, and everyone will be begging for my autograph. I'll have my own personal assistant and agent and publicist, and then one day I'll wake up in some fancy bed and realize that I'm a complete fraud. I'll know deep down that every other baseball player on earth earned their success through practice and hard work, but not me. I wished my way into it. I'll spend the rest of my life feeling like a lazy cheater. I don't think I'd like that. I really don't. That's how wishes work. It's called irony or cosmic justice or something. Well, no thank you. So yeah, there's this genie, an actual poofy pants genie floating right in front of me. And sure, there's Caroline Spencer, the green-eyed, hair-tucking Caroline Spencer in the back, okay, the front, of my mind. But I think for a minute and I look at the genie. He's got a devilish grin I didn't notice before. He's also got these hungry looking eyes. He slithers around in the air and wets his lips, waiting. So I say, no thanks, no wish for me. The genie folds his arms and scowls. You can go back to your, uh, slumber, I say. Sorry I disturbed you. The genie's eyebrows lower, melding together into one big eyebrow that stretches across his forehead. He doesn't look happy. You summoned me, he says. Yeah, I say. I'm sorry about that. I really didn't know you were in there. I point to the lamp. I was just messing around. A breeze picks up and the genie drifts a bit. You'll make a wish, he says. I can tell this isn't a request. I don't think anyone's ever turned this genie down before. And it's obvious he doesn't like it. He wets his lips again. His thin tongue flits out and back real quick. He hovers closer, floating almost right above me, and his eyes flash with fire. And now I know something for sure. This genie is no good. This genie is trouble. There's no way I'm making a wish. A lump fills my chest, and I take a few steps back. Do you wish for wealth? The genie says. He says it low and kind of threatening. I don't say anything. Do you wish for fame? He says. He wants to destroy me. I can see that. He's been in his lamp for who knows how long, and he's dying to get back to his old business of using wishes to ruin people. That's obvious, but he can only get to me if I wish for something, so I keep my mouth shut. Do you wish for someone special? He says. I stay quiet, but my face must be giving something away because the genie says, Ah, but you have to speak her name and she shall be yours. In my mind, Caroline's green eyes shine, but the truth is, I'm not even a little tempted. Sure, I probably ruined things with the whole Nito burrito thing, but this wish I know would destroy me. Worse, it would destroy her too, because the genie's not offering love. He's offering slavery slavery for Caroline Spencer. I mean, suppose I do wish for her, that I blurt out the words, I wish for Caroline Spencer. Then what? Just like that, she's mine? I own her? She has to do whatever I say? No, that's not what I want. That's not chivalrous. So I say again, no wish for me, and I start walking. The genie follows. His lamp stays back in the gutter. Wish for her, he says, floating beside me, his voice low and dark. I don't want anything, I say, and I turn the corner. Wish for her, he says again. After a few minutes, his voice is quiet but commanding. Leave me alone, I answer. We pass the sandlot where the guys play baseball, Eli Turner and the others. A few call out and I wave, knowing that they can't see the genie. I trudge up to my front steps and push through the door. The genie stops and seems to scowl at the doorframe. And I realize he can't come in, not unless I invite him in. I realize if I step inside and close the door, I'll be free of him. He'll have to go back to his lamp and it'll all be over. Wish for her, he says one last time, and his hungry eyes narrow. 
never, I say, and it's time for him to find someone more gullible because I'm not falling for it. I start to close the door and the genie says, we shall see, but the door latches and it's done. I breathe. I count to 10. I check the peephole and sure enough, he's gone. Honestly, I'm pretty proud of myself. Not everyone could have resisted a limitless wish. In the kitchen, I grab a banana and sit at the table. I think for a minute about things I could have had. Money, eternal life, my own private island to share with Caroline Spencer. I wonder if I've done the right thing. Maybe there could have been some other way, some safe wish I could have made to end up with Caroline. Maybe I could have just wished my Nito burrito away. But no, I should do things myself. And no one, I mean no one, should be wished into love, ever. I'm halfway through my banana when something strange happens. Suddenly, the world kind of goes poof. I'm not in my kitchen anymore. I'm back on Magnolia Avenue. The genie is there, hovering over that fire hydrant again. I'm so freaked out, I drop my banana onto the sidewalk. Hey, I say, I told you I didn't want anything. I told you to leave me alone. The genie hovers and smiles his devilish smile. His thick eyebrows come down and form one big eyebrow, and he laughs a big, deep belly laugh. You, oh mad, have been wished for, he says, grinning, and he points. It's her. Caroline Spencer. She's holding the lamp. She's looking at me, and she's wearing this shy smile. She's finished cleaning Miss Sutherland's erasers, and on her walk home, she must have seen the lamp in the gutter and picked it up. Hi, Matt, she says quietly, and she tucks the lamp behind her. Her green eyes flash, and suddenly I feel all numb. Something goes click in my head like a light going out, and I forget all about the Red Sox and the hot dogs at Fenway Park and the catcher's mitt I got for my birthday. Forever. I feel my eyes glaze over. I forget about everything once and for all, because how could anything else possibly matter? Anything, that is, except for Caroline Spencer and her green eyes and the way she tucks her hair behind her ears when she makes comments in history class. I mean, she's here and I'm here. And for the rest of my life, I'll do everything she wants. I'll go everywhere she tells me and I'll get anything she asks for always because I am hers. I am hers. I am hers. Thank y'all so much for listening. Hopefully you and your creepsters love these stories as much as we do. And remember, creep it real and and don't don't get scared. scared.